Okay, all right. So yeah. I listen. I want. I'd like to. I got. I'm gonna pitch a show. Okay. And pitch a show, and hear me out because, like, I think Thacko needs to make a comeback because when you did Thacko right, there was no math involved. You just like you knew what you rolled, and and there's like you know you don't have to do add anything uh, to to the to the roll. You know, you just like roll it, boom, you know, and then you get you get on with it, and like makes for a lot smoother fight. Like all the reputation it has. Like I don't really, know. What do you think? What do you think? Come on. It come really on. kind of goes against my my and most people's ideals and what they're liking it's very counterintuitive i i don't yeah. like this okay place. all right so okay right but what i'm saying is is that like you don't like it but what if i try like what if i just rolled for it what if you just let me roll uh what like you know like a charisma check you know like you're doing D &D. Are, like, you, are you we trying can... to persuade me yeah yeah that, yeah yeah come on jim what you what? can't make a roll and make it an indifferent or hostile creature completely change their mind we're not going to do it that's not how that works you can't no Oh, well, we ought to do a show about that. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Claim the Sky, the long-awaited superhero supplement for Cypher System by Monty Cook Games. Claim the Sky is a deep dive into all aspects of the superhero genre, offering you dozens of new character creation options, equipment, creatures, ciphers, expert advice, and more. It's even got a complete ready-to-use setting, so you can jump right into an action-packed game of astounding superheroics. And even if you're not playing the Cypher system, Claim the Sky has tons of stuff that's going to be useful for any game you're running, no matter the system, as long as it's superheroics. So grab a copy of Claim the Sky now at my Cook Games web store. Link in the comments and description. Hey everybody, welcome to WebDM. I'm Jim Davis. And today we're talking about one of the more complex issues of 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, the social pillar. Specifically that part where uh, your PCs are interacting with various NPCs of the world. What to do about it, how to adjudicate those moments, and what happens when uh, you know the bard or uh, you know warlock really rocks their charisma check and seems to throw everything for a loop. Uh, so, I mean, these can be really problematic moments in a game that can really throw DMs off and, 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 and undermine their confidence, and yet, like, the social pillar is the connective tissue between various combats and combat and exploration, and it, it can be the arena of, like, <laughs> tense, dramatic moments within a campaign, so you don't want to neglect the social pillar, you don't want to, like, play down social interactions. But I also don't think that D&D's rules are very clear on what to do about charisma roles and how to integrate them in with role playing. Uh, you know, like a lot of advice in the DMG, the uh, pages on it on 244 through 245 uh, for social interaction are filled with both eminently useful advice and yet deeply flawed <laughs> in some ways. And so it's understandable that DMs like don't have a solid grasp on how to run these moments. And when they have that, you know, uh, charisma focused bard that keeps rolling, you know, 25 plus on their persuasion checks, I feel like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I'm not supposed to tell the player no, but how do I handle those moments? How do I deal with these charisma rolls? Because in this way, like charisma checks can become a real problem for a campaign. And the way that players seem to want to use them, a lot of the popular conceptions of what various charisma proficiencies can and can't do, uh, not to mention insight and how that plays into all of this, like it, it seems as though there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding and, and, <laughs> and leading to a lot of moments of DMs pulling their hair out going like, how am I supposed to deal with a socially focused character that is able to bypass various conflicts within the game uh, and create these uh, issues because you don't want to get rid of that you don't want to get rid of those moments and there is a place for the socially focused character uh, in the game of DD but it really requires knowing how to uh, you know run social interactions and what it means whenever you call for a charisma check before we get started on that uh, you know, if you like what we do, you want to support the show, that kind of thing, you know the pitch. We're talking about our Patreon. WebDM Patreon has like something like 219 episodes uh, of our very rambly uh, podcast where uh, me and the rest of the WebDM team chat about 
various uh, topics in gaming and answer uh, patron questions. So head on over to the WebDM Patreon and check that out. So here's how I run social interaction in uh, in fifth edition DMG, and I actually think the advice given in both like the beginning of the player's handbook for uh, the basic gameplay loop of DM presents a context, players respond uh, in some way, and then the DM either determines if a role is needed or simply narrates the outcome, really like works very well <laughs> with the advice found on pages 244 through 245 of the DMG. And there's a lot of, of, of mention in there of like DMs, you might want this or this interaction might go one way or another. The players might temporarily shift an attitude uh, or something like that. And then there's also this table uh, on page 245 that lists a lot of DCs for various reactions. And it's easy to just look at that table, ignore the text, and then run into trouble when uh, your charisma-focused characters can easily beat DC-20 and turn hostile enemies uh, indifferent, uh, at least, uh, you know, according to the, the popular conception. So that's how I understand it, just from sort of my uh, understanding of how other people are playing, but here's how I run social interactions. For one, there is no way to completely divorce uh, player skill and character ability. The, the fun, the, 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 <laughs> the reason why we're here in terms of playing this game is because we want to we want to imagine ourselves as different people. We want to play act that moment. There's, there's all these different ways that we can engage a role playing encounter uh, with our creativity and the like. So we want to talk in character and act it out sometimes. Um, and, and like, I don't want to stifle that. I am one of those players. I want to, I'm not, not always talking character, but I always want to like thinking character, acting character, but it, it can also be a real, uh, problem. And then it can obscure what the goals of the players are and can obscure what the NPC responses is. So there's the role playing it out, the play acting part of it that is fun and enjoyable, but, uh, can get in the way. And then there's the character ability part of it. These are the feats and ability scores and proficiencies and spells and the like that the game provides to allow players and uh, certain NPCs and monsters to interact with this pillar of the game and present certain challenges, right? Zone of truth, detect thoughts, charm person. These are all the kinds of spells that are really useful uh, within a social interaction, but they also can trivialize certain things or create headaches. So you have to understand like there's both of these things going on. And as I'm running a social interaction, I accept whatever the player gives me. For the player, if they want to speak in character, great. If they don't, that's fine too. If what they tell me seems am am ambiguous or unclear, it's my <laughs> responsibility as DM to clarify, to ask for, uh, you know, what's their intent? What do you, what's the aim? What are you trying to get out of this? If need be, I will resort to game mechanic language. What kind of proficiency would you like to roll? But that's sort of a last resort. Uh, and I much prefer to have players either uh, describe the actions of their characters or what their intent is, uh, or even, you know, when, even when they do speak in character, uh, to ask clarifying questions afterwards. And if in that they say something that convinces an NPC, if there's something in that argument that that like perfectly aligns with the NPC's you know ideals and motivations and things like that, as I have them, as I have already determined them, then there's not a role needed. Like that encounter, that that moment of gameplay, can be entirely resolved by interaction between me and the other player. And again, it does not depend on the charisma of the player <laughs> or their ability to play act. It depends entirely on their ability to tell me what they want their character to do and how they present it. It doesn't need to be in character, even if that is enjoyable. But there are moments of uncertainty that arise in all of this. There are moments where I might say, you know, I think this player's making a pretty good argument, but that might be me, right? That might be Jim speaking and not the NPC. And it's in moments of that, moments of like the players are making a request, uh, they're, they're asking for something uh, or, or, or making a demand, the players are posing a question of the NPC, or just some sort of moment of uncertainty or tension within the conversation. That's when the dice come out. That's when I want to see what fate has to say about this moment. 
I don't have a hard and fast rule for this. This is just an instinct that I've developed over years of DMing. And it's easy if you're a new DM to sort of see like, well, like, you know, like any moment could be a moment of tension or like the kinds of things my players are asking for like that. They immediately <laughs> beg the question of, of would this NPC ask, uh, you know, uh, you know, or accept the request or something. Um, so they immediately go to the dice or they have players who are used to just like rolling their charisma uh, checks whenever they want or preemptively and then thinking that they have to accept uh, that die roll. Um, and the DMs don't. Like, whether or not there is any dice involved at all in this interaction is entirely up to the DM. And so that's what I mean. It's like it's a instinct that I've developed over the years because sometimes it's appropriate to call for a die roll and sometimes it's not. And, like, I avoid those moments of a player, like, <laughs> really orating their heart out <laughs> and, and going for it and, like really delivering an in-character uh, moment that is compelling and persuasive. And then I don't want to risk them <laughs> flubbing that with a die roll. There's no die roll needed, you know? So it's only in moments where there's uh, genuine uncertainty or tension that I'm going to call for, uh, for the die roll. All right. So this is the moment. The uh, role-playing, uh, the conversation has not produced any kind of uh, definitive result. So it's time to consider, um, you know, what to do next. How do you want to resolve uh, the, uh, the question or the moment of tension within a social interaction? And so as a DM, like, the very first thing that I do is I go back to the core gameplay loop of D&D. That, that loop of the DM describes the context, the situation, sets up the question, right? The player then responds with an action or, or something. And then the DM then interprets that. They adjudicate it. They say like, well, okay, that's either automatically successful, has no chance of success at all, uh, or, you know, let's roll whatever for it. And a lot of times the rules tell you exactly what to do in that moment. But there's a great many number of situations that they don't. And that's where the rulings come in. And so like considering is what is being asked of the NPC even viable is one of the most important questions you can ask yourself as a DM. Because before you call for a charisma check, you need to know what's at stake. What question is being posed? What, what is it that the players want the NPC to do for them that's going to require a change in their behavior that you want the dice to decide the outcome of? And it might be that the viability of that is either negligible uh, there's certainly no, uh, <laughs> you know, no way that the monarch is going to empty their treasury for a bunch of adventurers who come in, no matter what they roll on their die. Like, there's, there, there's no way that the villain is going to give up on their plans after a six-second appeal and a, and a crit on a persuasion roll, except, you know, you can't crit uh, proficiency checks, you know. So whether or not that roll uh, is, is even made in the first place depends on whether or not you think it's viable. And to me, there, this is the time to say, no role needed, automatically successful, great, you know, great way of putting it, or they were already amenable to help you, helping you and just asking, they're like, yep, of course, whatever you need. Or it's an automatic failure. There's no way they're ever gonna do this for you. <laughs> like, uh, or, you know, or there's, there's, <laughs> they can't, they won't, it violates some principle of theirs uh, or something. Um, but if there is a chance for success, no matter how small, there will be a cost involved. This is a social interaction, right? Two people, two, two beings are interacting with each other, even if it is a piece of fiction and make-believe. And that doesn't come without some kind of cost. So the first thing I'll do if I decide it's uh, a role's viable and has some kind of chance for success is to assign a DC. And honestly, I use the ones on page 238 of the DMG. That chart on page 245, I find is garbage. <laughs> I do not like it. Uh, I use it as a basis for, uh, for my own, but the DC numbers are based on page uh, 238 because it tells you right there, very easy, easy, medium difficulty, hard, very hard. Like all you have to do is ask yourself, what kind of challenge is this? Would it be a hard thing to do to ask the Baron for this favor? Then that's the DC. And I find it's a much more intuitive process and a much more uh, natural process for me as a DM than interpreting the, the, the page 245 table and, and its rather uh, low uh, DCs that it has. So 
each NPC has a different DC that the, uh, the players would need to overcome with their charisma check. And even before I call for that charisma check, I want to know what are the risks involved? What are the costs, right? This is that area where I think DMs can get in trouble because players might uh, request something absurd or ridiculous or just completely outlandish. And we've all been conditioned as DMs to be like, say yes, be a fan of the characters, be a fan of the players, like don't be an asshole DM, don't say no a lot. And, and it, there's a lot of like social pressure and expectation that whatever it is that the player has decided the role is about, if it succeeds on an arbitrarily high enough number, they will get that thing. And again, you as the DM have 100% control of that because you can say like, well, it doesn't matter how high you roll. This is the most they'll give you. This is the most they can do for you. This is the maximum you're going to get out of this one exchange. So even when you're setting those DCs and thinking about what it is, set the parameters for yourself. Understand what the NPC's limits are uh, and the like. And, and then what would it cost them to get more? What's it going to cost the PCs? What are they going to have to put on the table, right? These things are interactions, two-way. And in a lot of ways, the mechanics of D&D, the, the NPCs and monsters are entirely passive. They have charisma scores, they have charisma proficiencies for some bizarre reason, but they have no impact on the game whatsoever. And so if you want the P NPCs to not be passive participants in the interaction, they have to have asks of the PCs. No, I will not do this for you until you do X for me. That kind of horse trading, that kind of favors, that is the heart and soul of a social interaction game. And finding out what the other NPC wants what motivates them, what drives them, what are their secrets? How can you be of best service to them? Like that's how you have a game of intrigue. And finding those things out is part of this process as well. So how the players couch their arguments, how they approach the NPC matters, the information that they learn about the NPC matters, and they learn that information through social interactions, right? The DMG says if they spend a sufficient amount of time with an NPC, they can make an insight check to see if they can determine some sort of aspect of their personality, one of their bonds, their flaws, their traits, and the like. Finding those things out is going to be the way that the PCs can determine what they need to offer to the NPC to get what they want. That takes time, that takes risk, it takes an investment and a willingness on the player's part to engage with that part of the game. And for a lot of players, it's just a lot of work, it's, it's a different way of thinking. Uh, and it's much easier to just pose something outrageous, trust that they've sunk a, a lot of their uh, character options into boosting their charisma abilities, and then, you know, getting a high roll every now and then. And to me, the real heart and soul of these things is that exchange of, of learning about the other character, them learning about you, and coming to this uh, moment of like, can we resolve this decision? Uh, without needing the mechanics, and if we do, what's the best way to do that? Because there should be interesting failures. They should, uh, you know, have a cost of failing a, <laughs> you know, a deception roll on a character or an NPC that's friendly ought to come at a cost. The fact that these interactions can hinge on a single die roll and have monumentous impacts, I think is one of those things that makes social interaction intimidating. Combat, you've got all these sorts of things to rely on to uh, help you out. You got monster stat blocks, you got an initiative order, an action economy. You have all these things that tell you how to run this part of the game. And it might be tricky to get the encounter balance to work the way you want with your group, or maybe you're like me and you just don't care at all and trust that it'll work out in the end. But social interaction is like, this has as much impact on your game world as the outcome of a combat. And yet it can hinge on a single die roll that an optimized, or not even actually optimized, but just accidentally optimized <laughs> a character can easily beat. And so you really have to train yourself to think of these moments and, and um, understand that setting boundaries, what, what is and isn't possible, what are the consequences, and finally communicating it all very clearly to the players. And this is where I think that uh, speaking in character and play acting can really hinder social interactions because it creates ambiguity between the actual people at the table. 
right? So remember, uh, for me, game rules support the uh, the gameplay, which takes place at a higher level and is between actual people that exist in the real world. And that is always the most important thing. And so while it might be fun to play act out different NPCs and PC interactions and to play it close to the vest and like, oh, I don't know what they meant or, you know, that's not helpful to the gameplay. <laughs> that might be what it's like for the characters, but it is worth stepping out of that and breaking whatever sense of immersion you're going for it so that the players are clear what's going on. The NPC is doing X. This is how they respond. This is what they're waiting for. You don't have to give away secrets. You don't have to have to give away the answer, but you can say something more is needed. You will need to learn more about this NPC, spend more time with them to earn another check to see if you can progress uh, along the way. And so like all of that can be a real load <laughs> on a DM. So uh, it's okay to take a break during these moments of gameplay. It's okay to say, uh, yeah, let's take five. Um, while me and the player who, who's really doing the asking kind of hash it out, everybody else can go do whatever it is they want to do. Um, because you, uh, you know, you want to give yourself that time to develop the instinct so that uh, you can do these you know, more quickly. And obviously, uh, it goes without saying, should have said earlier, this is really just for the big stuff. This is not for the shopkeep interaction. This is not for talking to the bartender and trying to get some rumors. This is not for like 90% of the interactions you're gonna have between PCs and NPCs. Most of those you just play act out. Simple charisma role can help you guide that. Um, uh, but most of those, they don't have like an impact on the game world. So it's really not worth spending a lot of time on them. I'm talking about that small percentage of interactions that PCs will have with NPCs that have a chance to impact the gameplay, the campaign, that kind of thing. So I don't think you have to do this for <laughs> every uh, interaction uh, the party has with uh, you know sentient beings within the world. <laughs> So that's pretty much how I run uh, major social interactions uh, in 5e. Yeah, it's not very exciting. I don't really have a, a algorithm or a procedure or anything like that. I just have my experience. But that's how I built my experience. A lot of mistakes that I made in dealing with uh, you know, these game moments over the years, and I tried to learn from them. I tried to learn that shy players might not want to be really proactive, and I might not get what I want out of them, but I have to accept what they're willing to give me in order for us to have a game. You know, uh, I learned that I enjoy speaking in character sometimes, but for the most part, I don't like that as NPC because it engages a different part of my brain that uh, I don't want to engage in that moment, but I love it as a player. So, you know, that's just how I've developed it. For me, the big one, the big question I always had uh, when dealing with NPCs was like my own biases and my own reactions. A lot of times like these interactions would come after the players had already ruffled my feathers and pet my fur the wrong way. So I would find myself falling into very antagonistic NPC patterns of like authoritarian, you know, authoritative figures or, or whatever who were reprimanding the PCs for something. And, and it took me a, a bit of, you know, self-reflection to realize like, that's me <laughs> speaking through the NPC and I just need to not do that. I need to be... Uh, you know, addressing that some other way, uh, and that was its own learning process, but I developed tools to prevent that for myself. And one of those that I love the most, that I found the most useful in a variety of circumstances, is the 2d6 reaction role. Now you might have heard, of, heard us talk about this uh, on the channel uh, in uh, past episodes. We've probably mentioned it dozens of times <laughs> over the years, but uh, the 2d6 reaction role is a 2d6 table that is arranged into five categories, uh, although you can collapse it down to three, uh, usually broken down into two, which is hostile, uh, three through five, which is like aggressive, threatening, uh, six through eight, which is the, the neutral or indifferent range, uh, nine through 11 is like you know, friendly, helpful, and then 12 is the uh, you know, loyal friend uh, kind of result. And because it goes on a bell curve, uh, you get those extreme reactions much more rarely, something like 2.16% or something. Uh, and really it's the ones in the middle uh, that on the reaction roll are indifferent uh, that you get most often. And I think the mistake here is that indifferent or neutral or whatever, 
is easy to see as like boring <laughs> or like aloof or something. And because it's the result that's going to come up the most, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't want it to be uh, like unengaged, right? This is an NPC that's on the fence where it could go either way. The opportunity for the players to make a friend is possible. The opportunity for them to make an enemy is possible. And what the players do, how their characters act really matters. And so for those roles that come up that are like indifferent or neutral, um, really those, to me, those are the more interesting NPCs because there's a chance for it to, uh, to, to play out in a different way. And so usually what I try to do in those moments is to portray that NPC's neutrality to the hilt. Like they seem really uncertain, but still interested in what you have to say, uh, you know, or I'll engage in a bit of dialogue, uh, you know, in character to convey my, uh, you know, kind of like, well, I, you know, I, I like what I'm hearing, but you know, th th this isn't going to work for what I've got. Can, you know, can we come to a different agreement? That's really what's going on in those moments. I use these as a guide, not a straight jacket. Most of the time I use them to set the initial attitude uh, in, in 5e terms uh, for the NPC. So if it's a lower end of the scale, they're going to be hostile. Middle of the uh, bell curve, they're going to be indifferent. Uh, and then likewise for the uh, friendly at the top of the curve. And so, like, I am I just use it to help me overcome my own biases. And sometimes I custom make the, uh, the, the categories instead of using the generic hostile, indifferent, friendly. But for the most part, it's just 2d6 roll. Did I roll low? Did I roll high? Which band did it fall in? And I let that inform how I uh, portray that NPC initially. And then uh, the, uh, the interaction with the, uh, the characters will uh, you know, either prompt further rolls to help guide me uh, or will call for a charisma check uh, from the PCs to see if they can um, you know, uh, help resolve the situation. So that's my first tool. I love it. I, I absolutely love it, <laughs> and I use it all the time, even in games that aren't D&D. The second one is similar, uh, in that uh, I borrow progress clocks from Blades in the Dark, because I think they did it best, and every version of like skill challenges and social combat and all this other stuff is essentially just a progress clock. And I find the uh, clocks that are, you know, you got four ticks, six ticks, eight ticks, all you really need to determine is what is it that the players can do to fill a tick and what happens whenever all those ticks are filled. Uh, this could be like when the NPC's patience runs out or when they're convinced of an argument. You could have two clocks going at once. One of them, uh, if it fills up, is like, well, I, I, they shut down the conversation and they walked away. And the other one, when it fills up, is when they agree to the request. And then it's a matter of, uh, you know, which one of those fills up first. It's kind of an impromptu skill challenge in that sense. The third one is an NPC play sheet that I made for myself uh, that I kind of color coded and uh, arranged to help me best. But it gives me a snapshot of the NPC uh, as well as the game relevant information the, that they might have so that I can have it out when running like major NPCs. And there's usually only like less than six of these probably per campaign and that's for like a really long campaign but it's there uh it's, it's like a social stat block uh is how i look at it um and i, I found it very helpful in play uh and we'll post uh, uh some access to that so you guys can see what it looks like and um you know use it uh, if you'd like for yourself um and finally the last tool that i use uh, when running social interactions is a um, neat little blog post I found on the uh, blog Run a Game. And it lays out escalating encounter stakes from the lowest, like, threats to the highest. And I find it incredibly useful for thinking of social interaction and combat not as separate pillars, but as part of a continuum of conflict that can begin as a social interaction and end up as a combat, or vice versa. And this chart is incredibly useful in sort of breaking down into categories of like, what's like a personal harm that an NPC might want to do that's like not like life threatening or something. And so it's stuff like embarrass, humiliate, uh, you know, sp spread rumors about that sort of thing. Uh, and the post really does a great job of breaking it down. And I find it incredibly helpful in framing my thinking on like what's at stake during an important social interaction. 
yeah, that's the end of the show, right? So social interaction is pretty complex uh, in a game like Dungeons and Dragons because social interaction is complex in real life. Um, my final <laughs> word of advice for DMs is don't sweat it, talk to your players and understand that you have a lot more uh, control in this situation to determine outcomes and, and, and how the gameplay proceeds than you might think you have. Uh, if you want a longer form, uh, more rambly talk, then you should go check out uh, WebDM Talks on all podcasting apps. If you like the video, be sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, help us appease the algorithm gods. And <laughs> if you haven't yet, you can pre-order our book over on Backerkit. We're hard at work finishing it up, and uh, I think it's going to be great. You guys are going to like it. Uh, link in the description. Check it out. It is true about Thacko that if you do it right, there's no math involved when you roll. You did all the math ahead of time. It's also true that it's bullshit.